Julian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Julian, uh, for those who may not be familiar with uh, who you are and what you do, could you uh, introduce yourself? Yes, I'm an expert in communication and in sound. I run a company called The Sound Agency, which is an audio branding company, asking the question, how does your brand sound? And answering that for brands around the world, specializing really in soundscapes in physical spaces like shopping malls, shops, uh, and corporate receptions, offices, uh, hotels, and so forth. And interestingly, doing a lot of removing mindless music and replacing it with biophilic, that's nature-based sound that's much more pleasant and effective. Um, I've written some books, one called Sound Business, which is about that kind of thing, sound for organizations, and one called How to Be Heard, which is about uh, the sound we make and consume as individuals. So it's about listening and speaking, which are skills that we do not teach in school, but they're absolutely critical skills for life and for effectiveness and the kind of things I wish I'd been taught in school, actually. Mm. All right, folks, I'm really sorry to interrupt this episode of the podcast with Julian Tresher. I hope you're enjoying it so far. If you are, please consider subscribing to the podcast. It helps out the podcast so much more than you know, and it's kind of a win-win situation. I mean, you subscribing makes it possible for us to have even bigger guests on the podcast, uh, and and. Ultimately, the bigger the guests become, the more value I can provide to you. So if you subscribe, you get even more value out of these episodes. So, you know, something to consider, I suppose. All right. Enjoy the rest of the episode. And thank you. I love your your background. It's very fitting with the the audio waves. Did yeah, you thank you very in? much. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, sound is what I'm all about. I didn't mention I've had the, the honor of giving five TED Talks as well as, I think, 11 TEDx Talks which may be a world record, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and uh, they, they started out talking about sound and how it affects us and then moved through eventually to talking about this personal sound aspect, the speaking and the listening. And the one about speaking, in, which is the last TED Talk I gave, that's, one I think, the sixth most watched TED Talk of all time, amazingly. And I think collectively all these talks have been seen something like 150 million times, which is Incredible. fairly mind-boggling. Yeah. Wait, so I didn't know there was... Uh, so what's the difference between a, a TED Talk and a TEDx Talk? I'm not familiar with this. Well, TED is a conference that happens once a year in Vancouver now. It used to be in Monterey. Uh, and TEDx is a series... I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of TEDx events. They're local, locally organized. And it's a very interesting piece of brand extension where Chris Anderson has effectively said to people, it's like if you were Rolls Royce and you said, okay, go ahead, build your own Rolls Royce. You can put the Rolls Royce symbol on it with an X after it, as long as you follow these rules. Uh, so it, these are all self-organized uh, events all over the world. Some of them are bigger than the TED conference itself. I mean, the TED conference has, I think, 1,800 people. And some of these TEDxes are even bigger than that. There's one in India, which I think is 2,500 or 3,000 people. Oh, wow. So TEDx, self-organized, independent, and, uh, you know, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands around the world, everywhere from Kabul to, um, you know, Bolivia to, um, you know, the farthest Antarctica, I think there's been one in. Oh, wow. And uh, they're all filmed. So TED get to see all those talks. And sometimes people from TEDx get promoted, if you like, to the actual TED conference. Uh, so it's two different, slightly different things, but it all hopefully is ideas worth spreading. Mm, interesting. Julian, how did you uh, get into, what's your story about your fascination with, with sound and communication? Where did it start for you? I'm a musician. I have been from an, a very young age, really. Um, not that I was from a musical family, but I do remember my mother giving me records to listen to when I was very young. You know, a young person's guide to the orchestra, Peter and the Wolf, classical records, but they were wonderful. Carnival of the Animals. And they were great introductions. And I listened to them vividly and then moved on, obviously, to more contemporary music. Um, and I was lucky enough to live through the 70s as a teenager and a young 20-year-old. Uh, so, you know, prog rock, 
Um, and then punk and post-punk, I was playing in post-punk bands. So uh, I went through all that, made records, was a musician professionally for a while. Um, and I think musicians learn to listen in a slightly different way to non-musicians, because if you're playing in a band or an orchestra, you've got to listen in a very attentive way and a multi-track way. You have to listen to all the other instruments at the same time. Otherwise, you're not going to play very well if you're off in your own world. So I kind of developed that attentive multi-track listening. And by the way, for everybody listening to this, taking up an instrument is a really good thing to do, uh, not just for the fun of it um, or for the recreation, but also the research now shows that it improves your problem solving, your ability to ma manipulate information, your speed of thought, if you like. Musicians actually have larger brains than non-musicians. It's um, all been established in the last few years. So it's a very good thing for you to do, to play an instrument. Um, and then I, I developed a career in, first of all, advertising. I worked at a well-known agency called Such and Such in London. And then I went into magazine publishing, first of all, selling advertising. And then I became a publisher and a marketing director of a publishing company producing magazines. And then I left that to launch my own business. So for 15 years, I grew as an entrepreneur. I grew from a sole trader to a company turning over I think about 12 million pounds, employing 100 people with offices in Seattle, London and Munich, producing beautiful magazines for brands like Lexus, Microsoft, Apple, Orange, um, and so forth. Um, and I sold that in 2001. Now, all the way through that marketing, where I'd been understanding the need for brands to communicate well, which a lot of them didn't, uh, I was still playing music and still listening and thinking the world doesn't sound very good. So when I sold that business, I was able to bring the two halves of me together, if you like. Um, and I, I founded the Sound Agency to help brands to sound as good as they look. I mean, it is an amazing thing that still today, the vast majority of brands, brands, if you say, have you got a brand book? Oh yes, we've got a brand book, mm. great big thick thing, all about typefaces and colors and logos and so forth. How many pages are about sound? Uh, none. It's, it's incredible how many brands think that we exist only visually. Mm. Whereas, of course, we exist and experience the world in five senses, not just one. And how you sound is really, really important. So when I launched the sound agency, I did a lot of research and I came up with what was eventually my first TED talk, the four effects of sound, which are physiological, affects your body, psychological, it affects your feelings, cognitive, it affects how well you can think and how productive you are, and behavioral, it affects what you do. And we can go into proof of any of those later in the conversation, but that was the first TED talk and <clears throat> that was the basis of the sound agency. And so we started trying to get organizations to listen and, uh, you know, over a long period of time, I realized the reason organizations don't listen very much at all, which is borne out by the research hugely, is because organizations are basically just bunches of people and the people aren't listening. Hmm. So if you put a bunch of people together who don't listen, you get an organization that doesn't listen. And that's where the conversation started to move on to individual listening and speaking. The sound we make, the sound we consume as individuals. So that's a kind of long-winded answer to your question, I think, Patrick. No, that's that's good. There's so much to uncover. It's it's. I don't know many people uh, that talk about these things. Um, so, man, your work is really fascinating. I wanted to rewind a little bit to what you said about um, musicians have bigger brains. That's so fascinating. What is uh, What do you think is the biological reason for that? Well, it's a part of the brain. I mean, we now know that you process, we all process sound in a kind of um, holographic way. It's all over the brain. It's not, there, there isn't a sound center in the brain, particularly. Um, we do process, uh, process sound faster than we process vision because hearing is your primary warning sense. You can hear what's behind you and uh, you can hear in the dark. So eyes aren't very good at seeing what's behind you or seeing in the dark. 
And so hearing, I mean, there's, there's, there isn't a mammal, uh, or in fact, there isn't a vertebrate on this planet that doesn't have ears and can't sense vibrations. It's your, even bacteria and cells uh, sense vibrations. So hearing in that sense is, is the most important, the primal sense. Vision uh, came a lot later and it takes longer to process. You're, you're, you're reacting to a sound far faster than you're reacting to what you see. Um, so it's very deep, it's very fast. And I think in terms of music, uh, um, there's one particular part of the brain, the name of which I can't remember at the moment. I'm not a neuroscientist, but uh, there's one particular area of the brain that gets extended when you're playing music, especially if you're, you know, reading music. Uh, because if you think about it, you know, what classical musicians generally do uh, with a score in front of them with little dots all over it, they're processing information very fast and making sense of it in their brain. And then they're turning that into immediate physical movements of fingers, lips, whatever it might be, arms. Um, I mean, that's an incredibly complicated process, much more complicated than just sitting reading a book because there's no action right. that you have to take in that. So it's extending your motor capabilities, your, uh, your you know, accuracy of movement, your precision, your, the connection you have with every part of your body in that way. Uh, and even, I mean, I, I never read music very much. I'm a drummer, always have been, um, and I've heard all the jokes. I think my favorite joke is, how do you tell if the stage is level? The drummer is drooling out of both sides of his mouth. <laughs> okay. uh, drummers tell that one about bass players, of course. So, <laughs> um, But, you know, even with drumming, you've got four limbs and they have to be relatively independent. So you learn a more intense way of moving than just walking about or, you know, doing what comes naturally. So I think it's no surprise that, you know, your brain gets... Uh, extended, pushed. And I think there's quite a lot of evidence that um, even listening to music is is very good for your neurology. I mean, it's uh, used, there's a huge, huge association in America called the American Music Therapy Association who document many, many cases of listening to music or singing or chanting or just doing a drum circle, something very simple counteracts uh, all sorts of conditions like degenerative brain conditions, Parkinson's and um, and so forth, uh, and also helps very much with people on the spectrum. They can get enormous comfort from this uh, with other things like depression and so forth. Uh, even um, stroke recovery uh, is aided enormously. Wow. By... So sound, you know, sound really is very, very important. Uh, it's been used in healing for thousands of years. And uh, I'm sure we will discover there are scientific reasons for that. You know, just as the drugs that we consume these days mainly have been derived from herbal remedies, which have been used for thousands of years by people who back in the day were probably burnt at the stake or mm. um, accused of being witches. Um, well, I think we'll probably discover that the sound healing methods that have been used for thousands of years have got scientific validity. I mean, we are composed mainly of water. And water is a very, very good conductor of sound. I mean, not many people know this, but sound travels roughly three times faster through water than it does through air hmm. and much, much further, which is how whales, for example, uh, with their low frequency calls can communicate to other whales hundreds of miles away, you know, almost across oceans, or at least they could until we deafened them with all our ships uh, making noise at exactly those kind of frequencies. So we've, we've created a fog in the seas uh, where the whales and cetaceans find it very difficult to hear, which is tragic. So um, I think <clears throat> there's a lot more to discover about sound. And incidentally, I think we're about to move into a, a renaissance of sound, although we don't teach it, we've, we've ignored it. Um, ever since we've got, you know, rather less um, endangered. I mean, once upon a time, if you or I went into a cave 10 or 20,000 years ago, we would be listening mm. because there might be a bear or a tiger or a snake or something in that cave and it's dark and you better be sure that it's a safe place to be. So hearing was 
absolutely critical for our survival and for hunting, of course, just as it is for most animals these days. I mean, they'll, they'll, you know, if you watch a deer or a squirrel eating, their ears are going the whole time. They're mm. listening to what's well, not so much now. I mean, I see people riding bicycles wearing headphones, and I think, right, what yeah. a difference. You know, that's just mad. If you can't hear what's around you, it's your primary warning sense taken out, and you can't see what's behind you. Your vision is relatively limited to, you know, 180 degrees. That's just crazy. Uh, even walking around with headphones on is kind of slightly dangerous. There's a, there's a, a name for people who do that, pedestrians. But- <laughs> and... Uh, there's a lot of insurance claims that happen because people just walk out in front of cars and the, the guy has to slam on the brakes and he gets rear-ended by the person behind him. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of thing happens a lot. So taking out your primary warning sense is, is removing a big connection, I think, with the world um, and and indeed with other people. Mm. Um, you know, headphones, wonderful things. I'm wearing some now, um, but also very dangerous in that way. Um, in that we are replacing a connection with the world with something very different with music. And also because many people abuse them volume-wise and the World Health Organization reckons there are a billion, that's a billion, young people whose hearing is severely at risk through what they call unsafe listening practices, by which they mean 100 decibels going deep into your ears for hours a day. Right, that is kill your hearing, and I can start off more you, than than going to a loud concert or something. Yeah, you see it on on like the train when when you see someone now wearing earphones and you can hear mm. their music. Yeah, that's the their earphones. Damage. It's insane, and it happens more often <clears throat> than not. I feel like with with people True. my age, it's insane. Yeah, <laughs> what's well, a billion? A billion people. Yeah, I mean that that's we are raising potentially an entire deaf generation. And, you know, it's easy to be blase about this because, I mean, it's like um, walking on ice that's being eroded from underneath. You don't really know until you go through it and then it's too late. You know, there's no recovery for your hearing. There's no treatment that can bring it back once you've flattened those tiny cells in your inner ear with excessive noise. So it is a really big problem. And if you become very hard of hearing or deaf, which you do as you get older. You know, my hearing has degraded. I'm 65 now, and um, I, I've lost everything above 12K, roughly, 12 kilohertz. Well, that's, you know, I'm a drummer, and I, I spent years hitting cymbals, which is very bad for you if you don't wear... I now wear silicon-molded earplugs, which reduce the sound by 10 or 15 decibels, so I'm safe. But, you know, there were years when I wasn't, um, and this is the result. And it's harder to understand people in noisy rooms. That's called the cocktail effect, where you can't distinguish what somebody's saying because of the noise around you. It's frustrating. And if you get to serious hearing loss, it's incredibly isolating and depressing. You can't hear. It's embarrassing. Mm. People feel ashamed. They can't hear what people are saying. So they just cut themselves off and they don't socialize so much. They don't go to the parties. They don't go. They, they don't hang around people they can't understand. Uh, and it's it, it, depression, anxiety, loneliness uh, are, are common results. Now that we've got wonderful hearing aids, of course, but again, the research shows that the vast majority of people who need hearing, hearing aids won't use them for pride purpose, uh, reasons. You know, it's embarrassing. It's a shaming. It's, it's some sort of loss of face, mm. which is tragic. So... We need to look after these little things on either side of our heads. They are very, very important. Do we know of any way to uh, heal your hearing if you if you lose no. it besides hearing aids? No. No. I met a guy, I did a talk at TED Med some years ago in Washington, D.C., and I met a guy there who was starting to work on stem cell research uh, with the view to replacing these tiny little hair cells. I mean, they're not actually hairs, they're cells. Uh, that look like hairs, and they all respond to different frequencies, which is how you decode what is going on around you. You know, think about it, these tiny little uh, holes on either side of your head with an eardrum the size of your little fingernail decode everything from Beethoven's Ninth to an explosion to, right. you know, whatever. It's It's extraordinary that we can do that. And they locate sound around you, of course, and your ears help with your balance uh, also. Um, but these little cells, which are inside 
right in your inner ear in a, in a kind of shell shaped tiny thing full of flu fluid um they once they get flattened they can't be regenerated at the moment maybe in 10 years who knows mm. but you know if you're listening to this and you have headphones that's not <clears throat> a justification for listening to loud music for hours a day uh, i wouldn't rely on that uh, as, as a solution i would just turn it down a bit and you know that my best tip with headphones is get the best ones you can possibly afford you know do not buy cheap headphones because if you get cheap headphones the temptation is to keep turning it up turning it mm. up turning it up to get that bass louder well <clears throat> if you buy expensive headphones and by expensive i only mean like a couple hundred dollars maybe if you go above that you've got excellent quality you can listen with sublime pleasure at very moderate volume especially if they're over ear and especially if they're noise cancelling then you really do have a much better environment. You're taking away the outside noise. You can listen more carefully and more safely. So that's my advice on headphones. So what what things in expensive headphones are you looking at when you when you buy them? What specs or material maybe? Uh, just look at the reviews. Right. Uh, I mean, <laughs> like, uh, these days you will probably be looking for Bluetooth. Um, I I have a pair of the Sony WH WHX. What are they called? They ridiculously long, one thousand Mark IV or something. Um, that's not these ones I'm wearing. The, these are very, very comfortable for long periods of time, um, and I just use them for this kind of thing. But if I'm listening to music, um, I would use those uh, those Sony headphones. Um, they're active noise cancelling, which means they will remove constant sounds. Mm. They don't take out variable sounds, but anything constant, like an aeroplane or car noise or traffic, they'll do a very good job of removing. Um, and uh, the quality is fantastic. Bose also have a very, very good set, uh, which is comparable, I think, now. And these are, I think, I mean, in terms of pounds, I think they're about 300 pounds. Well, it's worth saving up to get something as good as that for your health mm. and your listening pleasure as well. Right. Do you fear uh, the digital age in terms of, I feel like... Um especially my generation, when I call a friend, he will not pick up and he will text me instead and be like, what's up? We have gotten scared of speaking over the phone and we are resolving to nonverbal communication more than ever. Do you fear that verbal communication and sound in that regards will go away at some point? Yeah, it's about to change, actually, which is the good news. Because... Um, there's a lot of money, billions and billions being spent on speech recognition and voice synthesis. Mm. And now we have AI mm. uh, turbocharging that. Um, so we will be freeing our fingers and our eyes from this uh, you know, kidnap that's taken place over the last 50 years or so, ever since email happened. And certainly since we've had mobile phones, um, devices we're carrying around where, you know, so much of our lives we're looking at screens. I mean, I think it's 70% of our waking lives. Yeah. We're looking at a screen. Unbelievable. Um, well, that is going to change because the user interface is going to move from text to speech. Hmm. That's so much more natural. You think about it, you can do other things when you're listening. So, you know, if anybody's just listening to this podcast as opposed to watching it, they might be having a bath, doing the ironing, driving a car, having a walk, having a run in the gym. I mean, it could be all sorts of different things because you can do something else while you're listening. And uh, you know, that's very, very powerful, I think. And in addition, it's the most natural interface we've got. You know, we've been speaking using complex language for possibly 200,000 years. Do you know we only invented writing 5,000 years ago or less mm. than 5,000? years ago, really more like 4,000. So for the vast majority of the existence of Homo sapiens on this planet, and probably for millions of years before that, we were using our voices to communicate, as, as along with gesture, touch and whatever, but mainly voice. Uh, originally, you know, n not with language. And there's a great book by Stephen Mython called The Singing Neanderthals, where he talks about how 
possibly language evolved from a proto-hum, he calls it, where we were verbal, but not linguistic. So, you know, you, we, we'd be saying, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, talking to each other quite emotively, but and quite clearly without using words. And of course, mother ease would have existed then, mothers humming to their babies and so forth. But when we inv invented language, maybe a couple hundred thousand years ago, music got cut off from its use as communication and became, mm -hmm. in inverted commas, useless, uh, became just aesthetic. And I totally d disagree with, um, what's his name, Stephen Pinker, he, he described music as um, auditory um, candy floss or something like mm -hmm. that, I can't remember. And music is so important. There's not a society that's ever been discovered on this planet that hasn't developed music independently. So to be musical is to be human. To be human is to be musical. It's part of our soul, if you like. Um, but I think to go back to the original question, we are about to move to away from the dumb aids that we've got right now, Siri, Alexa, Hey Google, those kind of things which are pretty stupid. Um, and they're just giving us pre-recorded or pre-destined scripted answers. We're going to be moving to an AI-based artificial intelligent, um, intelligent agent, if you want to call it that. A bit more like Jarvis in Iron Man, where we can have a conversation with it, where it learns. Uh, and, you know, my agent might be Fred. And instead of having to go into any one of about 50 apps I've got on my phone and start keying in credit card numbers and then responding to endless bloody six digit codes that people send me and so forth. I'll just say, Fred, uh, yeah, I've got to go to Brazil next week. Um, could you book a plane on Tuesday morning uh, or ha let me know what the flights and the prices are? And then I'd like to come back on Sunday. And by, by the way, while I'm there, could I see uh, Zhao for uh, lunch on the Thursday at that nice restaurant we went to last time? That mm. is the kind of natural language interface that we'll have. Fred will deal with all that. Come back to me. I might look at a screen when he shows me everything if I need to. And that's how we will be relating. So, you know, big questions there. Who's going to own Fred? Is it me? Google, Microsoft, Apple, who? Um, and Fred will be a big gatekeeper for people involved in marketing or selling. You're going to have to persuade Fred to let you through to me. So marketing will be quite different. And of course, this is all happening in sound. Mm -hmm. So, you know, companies that don't have audio brands may well cease to be visible or be noticed at all. So I do think that's going to happen. And I think we'll get back into the habit of speaking and listening. And I very much hope that's going to then influence our relationships with our friends as well and get us back to speaking and listening to them. I mean, text is very useful. It's asynchronous. It's quick. Uh, and, you know, to a degree, it's safer, if you like. I mean, I know the research shows that younger people would rather ask somebody out and definitely dump somebody using a text mm. rather than face to face or in voice, because, you know, you don't have to experience the comeback mm. so much. On the other hand, what are we losing? The depth of relationship, the intensity, the emotion, the, the bandwidth that we are as human beings. The voice is the instrument we all play. It's incredibly important. And if we lose contact with that and we just communicate with each other through text messages, I think we have lost a huge chunk of what it is to be a human being. Right. Have, have you heard of Neuralink, Elon Musk's uh, brain implant, brain chip thing? No, not really in detail. Mm. What's he doing with that? So they're theorizing, at least, and this is far in the future, I suppose, that we'll be able to speak to each other telepath, tele, what is it called, telepathically? Telepathically, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe, who knows, in the, in the future, but, you know, there would be a big discipline about that, wouldn't there? Who's totally in control of their mm -hmm. thoughts? When you're talking to somebody, you're often thinking something rather different to what you're saying, and uh, there's a, a little time lag between thinking and saying, we think faster than we can speak. Mm. And uh, so that's why for many people, for example, listening is difficult uh, because they're thinking about what they're going to say next and they're predicting what the person in front of them is going to say because we think that much faster 
um, the, the speed of thought and, and even typing is faster than the speed of speaking, which I think is a really important point because listening is a skill and it's a skill that we don't get taught in school at all, but it's a really important skill for building relationships, building team, inspiring people, and of course, becoming a great speaker. You know, if you want to be a good speaker, you need to be a good listener as well. And listening means you have to slow down. And we are so obsessed with saving time, multitasking. You know, the world is getting more and more frenetic. Attention spans are getting shorter and shorter to the point where, you know, I, I, I was talking to, the, to Chris Anderson about this. And, you know, people um, are even struggling to consume TED Talks, which are only 10 mm. or 15 minutes long. Uh, and he's, you know, he's looking at ways of they may have to react to that. I mean, there are lots of podcasts, for example. I mean, yours is is um, a good, solid, old fashioned 40 minute <laughs> podcast. Well, there are, lo there are lots of podcasts that are now saying, oh, we give you everything in three minutes or five minutes. You don't have to spend all that time. What? Mm. You really think we can live a light life like this where we consume everything in three minutes? That is superficiality. That's not depth. That's not relationship. And it's not patient uh, or compassionate or engaged in that way. It's flitting. It's being like a butterfly, just jumping from one thing to the other thing immediately. And if it doesn't gauge you in, you know, 30 seconds, you're off. Well, my goodness, what a lot of pressure on the speaker and how much is lost for the listener by being that much of a dilettante, being that much of a, a flitter. Uh, I, I, that's not a good way to be as a human being. And certainly if you want to give a great gift to people in your life, then you could practice conscious listening. And, you know, it, as um, Scott Peck, the author of that wonderful book, The Road Less Travelled, which, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't read, should be number one on your reading list. It's a great book about life and mental health and success. Um, he said, you cannot truly listen to another human being and do anything else at the same time. So the whole thing of, yeah, no, I am listening to you. No, you're sending a text. Mm. That's a different thing. You're partially listening or faux listening, if you like. And we do a huge amount of that. In fact, for many people, that's all the listening they ever do is listening while doing something else. Well, if you want to give somebody a great gift in your life, put everything down. Give them 100% of your attention. And I have a little acronym for this, which was in my TED Talk on listening. RASA. R-A-S-A. -A. Receive means pay them attention, look at them, and, you know, do nothing else. Uh, in in the Western world, at least, the, the dance of the eyes is that the speaker will, you know, glance about and look back from time to time to make sure that the listener is paying attention. The listener will look at the speaker all the way through. And if you don't do that and you start gazing around the place, it indicates boredom, lack of attention, lack of engagement, whatever. So pay attention, that's receive. Appreciate. It's the little noises that we can make, head bobs, eyebrow raises, smiles. Mm, oh, ah, really? Mm, that kind of stuff. Appreciate it oils the conversation. The S is summarize. The word so, very important word, being brutally abused around the world, mm. <laughs> hugely these days. I mean, there are so many people now who start every sentence with the word so. So means therefore. And, you know, if I say to somebody, what's your name? So I'm Paul. What, you're Paul because I just asked you. <laughs> you weren't Paul before. Uh, or, uh, you know, I even see people get on the TED stage and the first word they say is, so, what? There was nothing before. <laughs> there can't be a therefore. Uh, it becomes a habit. And it's unfortunately losing the sense of the word. It's a very powerful little word. So, uh, for example, so what I understood you to say is this. Did I get that right? Yeah. OK, well, let's move on to the next point. That kind of summarizing closes doors behind you in the long corridor of the conversation, locks things down. If you haven't got a so person in a meeting, it can be a very, very long meeting indeed, going round and round in circles. What is it we say about meetings? Places where you take minutes and waste hours. 
Um, that's the kind of thing that can happen if you don't have somebody going. So I think we've all agreed this. Now can we move on to agenda item two? And then the final A is ask questions. Why, what, where, which, when, who? There's open-ended questions that do not permit the answer yes or no and keep engagement. And that's a big tip, by the way, for people who find that people don't listen to them. If you listen to the other person and ask questions, you can move the conversation perhaps from their comfort zone to something you're more familiar with by asking questions. That's really interesting. In what way would that relate to this thing I do know something about? Mm. So asking questions is a very good way of furthering um, your engagement with somebody. And also people very much like to be interested in or to be listened to, yeah. to have you seem interested in them. That wasn't very good grammar. <laughs> people find it flattering if you're interested in them. So asking questions will smooth their egos and make it more likely that they'll let down their guard a bit and perhaps become less bombastic or egotistical and listen to you as well. So rasa, very useful in conversation. And conversation, I think, is, I hope anyway, is what we will be heading back to. Mm. You have a lot of good acronyms. Uh, you also have uh, HAIL. Could you expand on that? Yeah, that's for speaking, where, as I said, this is the instrument we all play, the human voice. And, you know, I, I stand on stages talking to groups of senior people, like, you know, 2000 CEOs in a hall. I say, how many of you use your voice with public speaking or presentations or team talks in your work? Everybody's hand goes up. OK, keep your hand up if you have had formal vocal training. Everybody's hand goes down bar yeah. about six. And I just think, what is going on? If your voice is really important to you, if you're selling, leading, inspiring, motivating, communicating, doing media, doing PR, whatever it might be, your voice is an incredibly important asset. It's the instrument we all play, as I said earlier. And you wouldn't want to go on stage in a major concert venue, having never practiced the piano. <laughs> Recital. I mean, that obviously would be mad. And yet people do this all the time. You know, CEOs who've never had training in using their voice are standing in front of rooms pitching for money or, um, you know, promoting their company or whatever it might be and not doing it very well because they're amateurs. And guys, if your voice is important to you, go get training. Get a voice coach, a singing coach, a drama coach, a presentation coach, whatever it might be. You can find them on Google, you know, find some near you, uh, call a few up, choose a couple that you like the sound of and go and have a trial session. And when you find one you like, work with them over a period of months and they will do wonders for your voice, which is an extraordinary instrument. So speaking is really, really important. Mm. A lot of listening. I mean, and, and, you know, think about it. In school, what do we teach? Reading and writing. We do not teach speaking and listening. This is nuts. What is going on? These are primal key skills. And probably the reason we are, you know, young people are now happier communicating in text is, is partly that. You know, we just don't get taught. These are skills. You can master them. You can become a master speaker and a master listener. Um, so, Hale was your question when you're speaking particularly in public but you know in general these are the four foundations that i suggest you stand on and if you stand on these four things you won't go far wrong so the h of hail stands for honesty and that is to be clear and straight in what you say not trying to use big words to impress people and uh, obviously being honest you know, saying the truth, uh, saying it in a way that gets the ball over the net to the other person, you know, being conscious of who they are and how they listen. The A is authenticity. That's being yourself. Even introverts, and if you've seen Susan Cain's wonderful TED Talk, you know, introverts can be quietly powerful. They may have to work harder than extroverts to go onto a stage and be in the spotlight. But you'd be amazed how many top public speakers in the world are introverts. I mean, I'm an introvert. 
And there are many, many people I've met on the speaking circuit who would describe themselves in that way. But they've learned to become comfortable going on stage and relating to an audience in a more, perhaps a more intimate way, not being quite, you know, loud. And, you know, you could be Tony Robbins, pacing the stage, huge presence, huge, you know, animal charisma and so forth. Or you could be Susan Cain, quieter, more gentle. There's a whole spectrum there. It all works. So you can be yourself. What do you think defines introverts and extroverts? Well, I mean, the, the Susan's book, Quiet, is a great exposition of this. Introverts tend to prefer quietness. They tend to prefer being on their own, uh, reading quietly, being in, you know, in, in less noisy situations. Extroverts tend to enjoy noise, bars, connection with other people, being in groups, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, everybody's position somewhere there it isn't just a bipolar thing mm. uh, you know it's a spectrum and we're right. all probably both uh, but most people would tend to one end or the other or more towards one end or the other it just is about how you feel i mean do you enjoy the prospect of going to a big party or is it slightly scary so mm. uh, for me definitely slightly scary <laughs> and uh, so you know, it's it's just how you feel and being true to yourself in that way. You can adapt it to be successful, whichever you are. And of course, that's only one form of what's now called neurodiversity. You know, that spectrum is joined by many others. You've got the autism spectrum of people who, you know, may be very uncomfortable with lots of sensory input. And this kind of thing is now starting to determine the way we design workspaces because obviously after COVID, workspaces have to be far more attractive, high quality in order to get people to come back to them. And we've also recognized that not only are there different forms of work, quiet working, team working, collaborative, you know, coffee uh, round, round the water cooler type in interactions. I mean, all sorts of different situations and contexts for work. But there are also different types of people who like different things. And that is informing color, sound, shape, you know, equipment and so forth. So we're thinking much more carefully, I think now architects are anyway. And I'm doing a talk to the American Institute of Architects um, tomorrow actually, ah, cool. about this very topic. Yeah. Um, which is free, by the way, if anybody wants to check it out. Uh, I think I posted on LinkedIn about it. There's a there's a link to a free ah, cool. uh, access to this. Um, so, I mean, we have to think carefully about about that. There are many many different types of people, um, and so that's we're still on auth authenticity. Being truly yourself is absolutely fine. Then the I is integrity, which is being your word. If you say it, you do it. If you promise it, it happens. And if that's not you, then your words will just tend to evaporate like puddles in the sun because people learn that whatever you say, who cares? So integrity is very important. Having integrity in life, following through on your promises and doing what you say. And the L, perhaps surprisingly, is love. Not romantic love, but uh, the kind of what's been called agape love or what Buddhists would call loving kindness. is simply wishing people well and giving a gift if you can but it's compassion so uh, if you're on a stage you know the biggest thing about being on a stage in front of people to understand which you know many people still don't is it's not about you it's about the gift you're giving to the audience and if you come on that stage with the intention of giving the gift to the audience you forge a far better connection you have a far better experience then if your only intention there is to be impressive and to get lots of applause and mm. to have an ego, boost, uh, people can spot that, you know, it's shallow. So that's hail, honesty, authenticity, integrity, and love, very important things. And I would say one other thing about speaking, by the way, which is, you know, foundational to my work in many ways, which is uh, the, the relationship between speaking and listening it's, a, it's an organic relationship, it's dynamic and it's constant. People think it's a straight line. I speak, you listen. 
It's a circle, actually. Because the way you listen affects the way I speak. The way I speak affects the way you listen. The way I listen affects the way you speak, and so forth. It goes round and round and round. They affect one another. So it's very important when you're speaking to be conscious of the listening that you're speaking into. How is this audience listening to me? You know, what time of day is it? Is it in the morning? Are they lively? Is it the last speech of the day? Are they tired? Is it just after lunch? Have they all their blood gone to their gut and they're sleepy? <laughs> um, do, am I coming on stage just after somebody who's really upset them or bored them uh, or really amazed them and wowed them and I've got to start all over again to regenerate them? So listening changes from moment to moment and very much it changes from human being to human being. We all listen in different ways. Everybody's listening is unique, as unique as your fingerprints. So asking that question, what's the listening I'm speaking into is really important. It's one of the most common mistakes I see in business all the time is people assuming everybody listens like I do. Mm. They don't, they really don't. And if you start to get that, then you've got a much better chance of hitting the bullseye instead of missing the target altogether when you speak, whether it's one to one, one to 10, one to a thousand, doesn't matter. What's the listening I'm speaking into? Right. Julian, where can people find your work? If you're watching, <laughs> uh, there are a couple of URLs for organizations. The soundagency.com is the company that helps organizations to listen well and make good sound. Uh, if you're talking about individual, uh, I have a course. Uh, I have uh, I, I go around the world speaking about these things. Uh, that's all at juliantreasure.com. Um, I have a couple of books out, as I said, as well. Um, so I'd be delighted to see anybody at either of those places. I also have a, a Substack blog now uh, where I'm posting regularly. So anybody who's familiar with Substack, you can find me there too. Awesome. Julian, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure, Patrick. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the podcast with Julian Tresher. If you enjoyed it as, a, as much as I did, and if uh, you can speak better than I can, uh, hopefully you will be uh, able to now that you have tuned into this episode with Julian. Um, yeah, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Appreciate that. The, the more subscribers we have, the bigger the guests I can have on this show, and the bigger the guests, the more value I can ultimately provide you. So it's, it's a win-win. You subscribe, you get even more and even better content, all right? So thank you so much, and peace.